Hello, and welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast, where it is my job to discuss democratic institutions. When we think of forms of government, what first comes to mind are presidentialism and parliamentarism. Yet, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these systems? And may there exist other forms of government that combine the benefits of both systems, ensuring the separation of powers and avoiding executive personalism? One answer is semi-parliamentarism. With Stefan Ganghof, I discuss his recent book Beyond Presidentialism and Parliamentarism, Democratic Design and the Separation of Powers, in which he studies and examines semi-parliamentarism in great detail. Stefan Ganghof explains what motivated him to write the book and why he thinks political scientists should spend more time on design thinking exploring alternatives to current democratic systems in use. He elaborates on how semi-parliamentarism assigns the two parliamentary chambers specific functions, making the first chamber to hold government to account, while enabling the second chamber to solve complex legislative questions. Stefan Ganghof is a professor of comparative politics at the University of Potsdam in Germany. He completed his doctoral thesis at the University of Bremen and his habilitation at the University of Cologne. He has published in many leading journals such as Comparative Political Studies and the Journal of European Public Policy, among many others. And he has written two books prior to Beyond Presidentialism and Parliamentarism. You can find the link to his website in the show notes. I'm very happy and grateful to have him on the show. I am your host, Stefan Kaibertz, and this is the 16th episode of the Rules of the Game podcast. I am a political economist with a PhD in economics from the University of Bern in Switzerland, and I previously held positions at the London School of Economics and Political Science and the Center for Global Development. You'll find a full transcript of the conversation on my website, rulesofthegame.blog. If you like this podcast, please leave a review on your preferred platform and share it with friends and colleagues. Now, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Stefan Gongho. Stefan Gongho. Welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast. I'm very happy to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. As usual, I ask the first kind of personal question, which is what is your first memory of democracy? So for me, I'm not sure it's my first memory, but it's definitely the most important memory for me was, um, so when I was in high school, I got very concerned about environmental issues, climate change and so on, which is a little bit frustrating because it's a long time ago. Um, and nothing really has changed. But um, so I got very active in environmental organizations and that scaled up quickly. So after high school, I was basically for two years, I was a full time campaigner and activist um, and educator in this environmental movement. And uh, what was striking for me was not only how we sort of interacted as an organization or as a movement with the democratic state, but also internally, this organization I was working for um, tried to have a very radical um, reform of its own organization, very decentralized, very democratic, which in my view completely backfired. So the, the effort to become a very decentralized, open, inclusive um, organization ended up concentrating a lot of power in those people that really knew how the organization worked, which were actually the paid people that, that were supposed to be controlled by the unpaid people. And that was very, that really was something that uh, deeply bothered me. So that's actually why I, I think I would have studied something else. And then after this experience, I studied, I started studying sociology and I studied organization theory, like Herbert Simon and that sort of stuff, because I really wanted to understand how organizations work and how institutions work and how that, that can happen. 
and so that's it basically set me on the path to um, becoming a sort of institution focused political scientist yeah that's that's very interesting so it's it's usually i think also in my experience that people have a certain event or a certain experience that that makes them uh, study something specific because they think oh this is this is kind of bothering and um <laughs> i i want to understand why this is happening right so obviously for me also the institutional questions are crucial and also i o only after a while really started to realize that actually the institutions are so important in terms of organization and what outcome that leads to. So now we want to move on to discuss your book Beyond Presidentialism and Parliamentarism. And what I would like to know is when did that motivation to, to write that book emerge and, and what kind of motivated you really then to start and move beyond this terms of just presidentialism and parliamentarism and uh, right on semi-parliamentarism. Where did that uh, motivation come from? So before I answer that question, if I if I may, um, I just want to mention that the book is uh, open access, which is not usually the case. So um, listeners who might want to read up on some of the stuff that we are going to talk about, they can just go to the homepage of Oxford University Press um, for the book and they will find an icon where they can just download the PDF. So that's just, uh, um, I just want to mention this. Of course, I will uh, link to the to the book in yes, the show notes. Yes, great. So sort of the book really brings together a lot of research in different areas, actually, that I've done over the years. So in a sense, this book has been long in coming. But the reason why I eventually decided to write this book or to bring it all together in a book, the two main reasons, one is more general and one, one is more specific. So the general reason is in a sense already the one that you sort of hinted at in, in your question, which is that I think there is, or for my taste at least, there's a little bit or too little design thinking in political science. So political scientists are really interested in understanding the world causally, understanding cause and effect in the world, you know, how the world is the way it is. And that's important, of course, very important, but in my view, the reason why we seek causal knowledge is that we try to change the world or try to, you know, um, intervene in the world and, and come up with solutions also. Just uh, not only explain sort of how we get here, but also how, how we might uh, change things. And so, yeah, it, it always bothered me. So in, in my view, a lot of people seem to think that the, the three basic constitutions that, that we have in the democratic world, the parliamentary the presidential and the semi-presidential, that this is somehow all there is, or that somehow the underlying assumption seems to be that history is efficient and it will lead us to the solutions that are the best solutions. But I don't think that fits what we know about history. History isn't efficient. History is path dependent. And these systems evol evolved out of the systems that were there before, out of monarchy, basically, and they reflect power structures at the time that they were developed and they reflect certain ideas. And some of these ideas were just wrong. We know today that they're wrong. So that's precisely what bothers me is that, for example, now in, in a country like Chile, where, you know, in the few moments when a window of opportunity opens up that we can change maybe constitutions, I think then people start to think about maybe alternatives. But if uh, political science and constitutional theory has not worked out certain things systematically before, you know, you cannot ad, ad hoc come up with new solutions. So the natural tendency is to always go back to the same solutions, which is, again, what happens in Chile now, right? Presidentialism, parliamentarism, or semi-presidentialism. And so I think, at least in theory, it's, it's plausible or possible that there might be better systems. And so I think uh, political science should work on them a little bit more systematically. So that was so that's sort of a general idea. I think I wanted to write a book, which is not only do you know explanatory work, but also tries to think about new designs. And the second more specific reason. So I'm entering this debate about um, presidentialism, parliamentarism, or this debate. And you had a podcast about this before has often been framed as a debate about the perils of presidentialism. So much of this debate was about the famous work of Juan Linz, who had this argument that there is something inherently wrong with presidential systems. And there was also the assumption that the sort of the natural solution is to go to a parliamentary system. 
and now with Trump and um, you know all these uh, the consequences of of, um, of Trump and the the problems that various presidential system um, have, this sort of reasoning has become very prominent again. And I want to say that since the work of Hohen Linz, I think the political science literature has learned a lot. We've made a lot of progress. So I think this, and also this debate has in useful ways, I think moved a little bit away from Linz and also moved a little bit away from the issues that motivated Linz. But my feeling was and is that still this debate is a little bit less productive than it could be. And the reason is to just anticipate the argument a little bit, sort of presidentialism, in my view, has two main features. And Lin's view was that both of these features are bad. And my view is only one of these features is bad. And if you get rid of this one feature, then the other one is actually more, can be more of a solution than a problem. So what are these two, two features? And then I'm, I'm gonna stop. So, so one of these features is a separation of powers. Right, so the separation of powers simply means under presidentialism, voters elect two branches separately, the executive branch and the legislative branch. And these two branches are independent uh, from one another to some extent. That's simply the separation of powers. But the other feature of presidentialism is that one of these two branches is a single human being, right? The president, the executive branch in a presidential system it's just one person, which I think in a pluralist, complex, big society, it's quite an interesting feature, right, that you would concentrate so much power in a single human being. And it's important to understand this. So the reason why the presidential system personalizes power, because you elect a single person, you don't elect you in a parliamentary system, you elect an assembly or you give power to parties and then they choose certain persons. But under presidentialism, you elect directly, the constitution authorizes a person, and this person cannot be removed by a party or by an assembly in a normal political procedure, in a majoritarian procedure. You only have these extraordinary procedures like an impeachment. So these two features together, you authorize a person, and this person is really hard to get rid of by anyone. This is why it personalizes power. The argument that I try to develop in the book is that, in my view, and this differs a little bit from the Lindsayan critique, is that the problem of presidentialism is the second aspect, what I call executive personalism, this power concentration in a single person. And the idea is that if you could get rid of, um, of this personalistic element, then the separation of powers, this giving voters the option to elect two different institutions, actually has also a lot of advantages. So that's where I differ a little. And this also means that I have a... So when, when colleagues pursue this Lindsayan argument, they naturally think that, well, and you had a podcast on this, so the idea would be, well, to change a presidential system, the obvious solution is go to, to go to a parliamentary system, Right. And that's how the debate is usually in the United States or in, in Chile now. And maybe they consider a semi-presidential system, but sort of one side says, well, everyone should do a, should have a parliamentary system. Um, and that's and, and sort of my book or my argument or my perspective leads to a little bit different conclusion. I would say there, there are good reasons to have a separation of powers. The maybe the most more realistic and feasible alternative to a presidential system would not be a parliamentary system, but it would be a different separation of power systems, one, one that focuses on getting rid of this personalistic element. And that's what exactly we're going to talk about in, in this podcast. Also, we want to elaborate a bit more of the details and problems of, of pure parliamentarism as well. And just before I go to that point, I want to quickly just reply to your first point that the design thinking that you mentioned. And I think actually that's also one motivation for my podcast that I think we should discuss more alternative systems like you do in, in the book as well. And because as you say, the, the solutions, they should be ready when there is a window of opportunity. And that's why also I think 
political scientists or constitutional researchers should have these uh, solutions kind of ready? Or what does it mean, for example, what would the U.S. look like in a parliamentary system or what would direct democracy look like in Nigeria to have these alternatives ready on the table when they are needed? Because exactly as you say in the Chilean case, maybe more preparation would also lead to different solutions, right? If, if those solutions were, I mean, solutions or propositions, maybe more would be on the table, then the discussion could maybe go in, in different directions. And that's why I think your book is, is so valuable uh, because it pushes the boundaries in, in a different direction to think more about what does semi-parliamentarism mean. And because semi-presidentialism, as you say, is like quite common. It is implemented in, in, in many countries. So as you say, we know like that presidential systems, they are often criticized. The criticism is quite well known. And then the alternative is usually to go to parliamentarism. But you take it like a step further and you really criticize uh, parliamentarism. And so what are the main problems that you see with parliamentarism? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's an important question. So and I want to make clear. So my point is not to criticize parliamentary system. In fact, sometimes people get this wrong. So um, I, I remain sort of undecided whether um, I don't argue, I don't argue that parla semi parliamentary systems are better than parliamentary systems. I remain undecided in the book. What I do say is that the the colleagues that say, well, presidentialism is bad, and they just uh, you know everyone should just do a parliamentary system, they fail to see that the 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 people that defend presidential systems also have a point, right? And that that explains why they're so resistant to just go to parliamentary system. And that's why it's important to understand the problems of a parliamentary system. So what are these problems? So for me, the, the core institution of a parliamentary system is the vote of no confidence, right? The ability of parliament to, in a normal majoritarian political vote, to get rid of the chief executive, right? So the, the prime minister is always just an agent of the, of the party or an agent of the assembly majority, and he or she can be replaced basically at any time. So I think this no confidence vote is a really important, good invention of, of democracy. It's one of the crucial inventions of democratic systems. However, so the, the, the a pure parliamentary system gives this confidence power to the entire assembly, right? So every member of the assembly has the same formal power over the cabinet. You know, you know every vote counts potentially as a vote against the cabinet. And that's a problem because it means that whatever complexity you have in the assembly, you know, if you have many parties, many conflict dimensions, um, you know, anti-system parties, whatever complexity you get in the, in, the, in the assembly, in parliament, tends to be translated into complexity in government. Okay, so this is important because we see this all over the parliamentary world, right? What we see is we have systems like um, Israel or Spain, where we had several elections in a year because it was impossible to build governments. You have governments with very many parties, like in the Netherlands, you know, with four to eight parties, Netherlands, Israel. Um, you have systems where it's extremely, it takes extremely long to even build governments. Like, for example, the Netherlands have recently, in this month, inaugurated a government where the election was last, last March. Mm -hmm. Or it can even fail, right? Yes, and, and it can fail. It takes a long time. And we have a general trend in the parliamentary systems that because there is a general trend all over democracy that um, we have more fragmentation in parliaments, more parties, more conflict, more polarization. And in parliamentary systems, all of this complexity and difficulty in parliaments is being translated into the government. And that creates problems. For example, also, even if you're able to create a government, like look at Germany. So for a long time, we had a grand coalition that nobody wanted. And now we had an election where, you know, two parties on the left and two parties on the right had a, like a pretty antagonistic um, campaign. But then now they have this traffic light coalition where uh, one party of the right has to, you know, have to, has to have a coalition with two parties on the left. And so, you know, we already know that there are a lot of issues that are completely 
absent from the coalition contract, essentially. So there will be nothing be done about income redistribution. Um, so on, in tax policy or social policy, essentially, in many areas, nothing will get done. So that's a problem that in sort of in a nutshell, in a parliamentary system, if you have a more complex parliament, it's very difficult for voters to make a clear choice. You know, for the next four years, I want to go in this direction. I want to make climate change a priority. I want to reduce taxes. I want to increase taxes. These sort of more general directions for the government are really difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. But would you agree that you kind of want that complexity in parliament? Because, for example, if you have a more proportional system, right, you will end up with more parties, but also that probably reflect better the, the preferences of the voters or resemble the, the society in, in parliament. So for the representation of interests in parliament, you also kind of want that complexity, but you don't want it to translate over into government because you want to have a stable government. And often, for example, a fragmentation in, in the assembly translates into, into unstable governments. Would you agree with that general view? Yes, yes, I think, I think I think that's right, and that's exactly the reason why <clears throat> a separation of powers might be attractive. But on the other hand, so I'm, I'm not arguing, so I think you're right, but also, I mean, of course, in the end, all of these systems have to deal with the same problems, right? So, and, and I'm not saying that parliamentary systems cannot maneuver this landscape. So what parliamentary systems, the successful parliamentary systems do, is to find some sort of sweet spot, some medium, Right to allow for some degree of complexity, some degree of multi-party, but find ways to still manufacture majorities. And there are different ways to do this, right? To have to some degree of disproportionality in the electoral system or to give some parties or coalition a bonus. There are different solutions within parliamentary systems. And that's an interesting question. So I'm not arguing that these solutions are necessarily, necessarily worse than the ones that are possible under semi-parliamentarism, which we're going to talk about later. But I just want to say that finding a solution um, under parliamentarism to balance sort of the stability and of government and the, the ability of voters to make a clear choice with the very important goal of having a representative, inclusive parliament, finding this balance under parliamentarism is really difficult. And that's just my point. And that explains why um, the separation of powers is interesting as a as a constitutional structure. And co countries really struggle with finding that, that right balance, right? Between, for example, putting voting thresholds to have fewer parties or yeah, maybe making the, the system less proportional so that you end up only with a few blocks in, in the parliament that can e more easily form a government. So I... I really see this problem and this struggle of parliamentarism to find find the balance. So you are saying the separation of power is is an interesting element of uh, you know separating the government from parliament. So in a semi-parliamentary uh, system, how is that really implemented? So can you explain what are the characteristics of a semi-parliamentary system? I, I, I'll answer this in a second, but maybe it's it's good to first mention the two general advantages of a separation of power. Okay, sure. Go ahead. These are the two advantages in, in a way that also apply to presidential systems. And then in a second step, I think it, it's then we can say, well, what is the difference to, to a presidential system? So I think the two, two advantages of a presidential system or of the separation of powers is first, if you have two elected branches, if you elect two branches separately, you can simply have two different electoral systems, right? So you can, um, in a presidential system, you know, you can elect the parliament, the assembly with a proportional system, as we just said, to have this representativeness. And of course, presidential systems are by their, uh, presidential elections are by their nature majoritarian, right? So they give voters a clear choice between different candidates. And often in, in presidential systems, you also have pre-electoral coalitions, so some parties um, group together under one candidate and, and another group of parties group together for another candidate. So you have this um, clear choice. So in a way, presidential system can give you both, the proportional option and this majoritarian option. That's one advantage. And the other advantage is because the parliament does not have a no-confidence vote, 
because it doesn't have to keep the government in office. It's actually liberated in a sense to deliberate on specific pieces on um, legislation more freely. Because what happens in a parliamentary system, for the reason we discussed, in a parliamentary system, one of the most important priorities for a government would always must always be to be stable, right? So the standard solution to be stable is to, to build a sort of cartel, if you want to say it in economic terms, right? So now, if, for example, the traffic light coalition in, in Germany, you say there are three parties and they form a cartel in the sense that we say we redo players, so none of us can do anything without the other. And we're not allowed to build coalitions with other parties in the legislature. And that's also, I mean, this might be inefficient because they block each other. And it might also, some people think it's not particularly democratic because it means there might be majorities in parliament for certain measures that cannot be passed because one of these actors doesn't want it. Or it could be that one of these actors, which is part of the cartel, one of the veto players, in order to make a decision, they have to make a lock roll as a sort of like a trade. So one of these parties maybe gets something that a clear majority in parliament does not like. So in a sense, this, this cartel politics that we have under parliamentarism can also be seen as, as problematic. And you know this from Switzerland because Switzerland also has a sort of separation of power system, a different one. But in Switzerland also, you can get different um, builds, different legislation passed with different coalitions. So there is more flexibility. So it's more issue-based, really. It's more issue-based. And some people believe, or some authors believe that this issue-based um, decision-making has some attractive features. So these are the two, two main examples, I think. Um, you, have, you, can, you can mix two electoral systems and you can have more of this flexible decision-making. And that's true for both presidential systems and semi-parliamentary systems. So what I argue is that, but as we said, in a presidential system, I, I pay for these advantages by having this amazing power concentration in a single human being. That's what I call executive personalism. So now if you think about what I just said, so if, if we want to th think about what, how does a, a semi-parliamentary system look? So what, what we said, we said two things. First, the problem of a presidential system is it doesn't have any no-confidence vote, right? So th there's, no, there's no way to get rid of the chief executive by some assembly or some party. And we've said in a parliamentary system, the problem is that the entire parliament has his no confidence has his no confidence vote, which means that the complexity of parliament is translated into government. So the solution, if you view it this way, the logical solution is to say, well, divide the parliament in two parts. In the easiest case, this will be two chambers. But as I explain in the book, we don't have to get into it here. It doesn't have to be two chambers, but it could also be a committee in the chamber. But the easiest way is two chambers. So you divide parliament. And you say one of these two parts, both of these parts are directly elected. And one of these parts has a no confidence vote against um, the government. So it means, in a sense, in one of these chambers is just a really legislative chamber. One of the chambers is just parliament as we know it, in a sense. Um, and the other chamber is a sort of confidence chamber. So one chamber has the task of selecting the government, selecting the chief executive, and can remove the chief executive in a no-confidence vote. And the other part is completely separated. The other part has no no-confidence vote. And I think in this way, um, you, get the, you get the two advantages that we talked about. So again, you can elect the two chambers under different rules. So the legislative chamber, which is about controlling the government and making legislation, this chamber should be elected under proportional rules. And the other part could really be designed to mimic a presidential election. So in the other part, in this confidence chamber, you could and should use majoritarian rules because there the goal is to really allow voters to make a clear choice between, let's say, center-right government and a center-left government. And that's an important point in the book that I argue that this, this confidence chamber, it could actually be designed that from the perspective of voters, it looks like a presidential election, right? You have candidates, you have parties aligning with these candidates, and <clears throat> the, the camp that wins will elect the chief or select the chief executive. So from the perspective of voters, nothing really changes. 
because they know, because that's the thing, like the important thing about presidential systems is what political scientists call identifiability, that voters are directly able to select the government, right? That there's no pre post electoral bargaining, no like backroom decision making, but voters can directly determine who the government is. So I think that this is also po possible under a semi parliamentary system. So it looks like a presidential election, but so there's no personalization. Parties are always in control. They select who their candidate is, and they can also. You know, if they have a Trump, if they have a complete lunatic who wants to set the world on fire, then they can get, just get rid of this person and replace him or her by another person. And which I think is really interesting is that one chamber is really separated in the sense that it is responsible for legislative tasks, right? And I really like this idea in the sense that one chamber can have this complexity also and resolve a legislative task without interfering with government. I mean, that's a really important point. And, um, and I can elaborate on this a little. I mean, this is part of the, um, the, the logic of the system. The proportional part has to be the separated part, right? The, the part that does not have to keep the government in power. And that's absolutely crucial. Because we said the problem of parliamentary systems is that this complexity of parliaments, of proportional parliaments, multi-party parliaments, translate into government. So the, the proportional part of the system should be the separated part of the system. So think about it this way. I mean, this is may maybe helpful also for the listeners. So the structure I described is a structure where one of the two chambers, so both chambers are directly elected. So which means both chambers have the same democratic le legitimacy. Okay, that's important because that's actually really where most bicameral systems have a structure where the first chamber is clearly more democratic and the second chamber, for various reasons, is less democratic. And that's why the bicameral, the, the literature on bicameralism in political science talks about a lot of other things. But that's not what I'm talking about. There are very, very few systems where the second chamber and the first chamber are really equal in terms of democratic legitimacy. Okay, and then if you have this, if you have both chambers with equal legitimacy, then what you're basically saying is one of these chambers relates to the government as in a parliamentary system, namely the first chamber. It selects a government and can remove the government. And the other chamber relates to the government as it would be in a presidential system. It doesn't select the government and cannot remove the government. That's exactly why sort of the semi-parliamentary label is apt, because you have two parts of parliament and they relate to the government differently. So you were just to understand really, the, so what you call the first chamber is also the upper chamber, what we usually call the upper chamber. Is that right? The systems that I'm talking about, and it's a very small set it's a very specific system. I'm only talking about systems where they're absolutely equal um, in terms of legit legitimacy. The only difference I consider in the book, but that's a footnote, is that, I mean, there's a lot of talk now about having sortition chambers, so randomly selected chambers. And the argument in political theory would be that randomly selected chambers are even more democratic than elected chambers. So, you could even imagine, and I talk about this, there are proposals for a kind of semi-parliamentary system where the second chamber is actually randomly selected. So then it would have actually, then, then this would be sort of the more democratic chapter. But I don't try to avoid this terminology. That's why I call it first and second. But, but first and second says nothing about hierarchy because there is no hierarchy. And that is really absolutely crucial for my argument. You see, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, no, it's just a parliamentary system with a, with a strong second chamber. But the reason why we consider most bicameral countries as just parliamentary is that we know that the first chamber is the only democratic leg democratically legitimate chamber. And that's why we define the system of government based on this chamber. Okay. But if both chambers are really equals in terms of democratic legitimacy, 
then you cannot do this, right? Because you know you could you, could, you look at one cham- chamber and say, oh, it's parliamentary, and then you look at the other chamber and says, oh no, it's presidential, because this chamber has no no confidence vote. So I'm saying, yeah, yes, because it's neither parliamentary nor presidential. That's why I call it semi-parliamentary, because you have two equal chambers that relate differently to the government. And also, I think it makes really sense to to call them first and second chamber and not upper and lower, because you want to kind of uh, not have this hierarchy, right? They just have different functions. Exactly. They have different functions in legislating and supporting the government. And another way to think about it, I mean, think of it. The president in a presidential system is all also a chamber in a way. It's just a chamber with one person continuously giving confidence to himself or herself. That's all it is. Because remember, executives in democratic systems are not only executives. They have very strong legislative powers, right? They have veto powers. They have agenda powers. So a president is a chamber. A presidential system with two chambers of parliament has effectively three chambers, but one chamber is just a one person chamber. So there's not really, what I'm just saying, the executive branch, this one person chamber should be a proper chamber. Mm -hmm. And would you agree in that sense that in a presidential system, you know, at least in the, in the U S it's the case that the Senate is responsible for impeachment, right? Would you say that your first chamber that can remove the government is like, an Im- impeachment, but made much easier because they continuously control the government and can remove it any time without any legal reason. There is just political reasons. They can remove the government. Exactly. And I think that's a very important point. And I talk about this quite extensively in the last chapter of my book, because I think the evidence shows that impeachment procedures are really, really problematic. And I think it's really important if you sort of, if you read the word of uh, work of someone like Adam Chaworski, right? What he says is the, the, word, the way democracy works is that democracy settles who is in power. And democracy tries to um, bring all the, co- the conflicts in society into the institutions, right? You don't want to have conflicts out of the institutions. You want to have them settled in the institutions. And it should be clear who legitimately got power and who didn't. Now, the problem with impeachment procedures is that with an impeachment procedure, you try to sort of, you always have this problem that the side that defends the president argues, oh, you're just making up charges, right? Because you lost the last election and you want to reconfigure the power structure, right? And the other side says, well, you're you're defending a president who clearly, you know, should be impeached. Sort of you're turning every impeachment procedure you know, you're re- reopening the general power structure because everyone knows, if uh, the one side knows, the president's side knows, well, if the president is impeached, it's going to hurt our side altogether, right? And so w- what a lot of people, a lot of sc- scholars, colleagues on, on Latin America have found that, and Linz also argued this already, that sort of these impeachment procedure always tend to lead to sort of a constitutional crisis, You know, when Rousseff in Brazil was impeached, it was some people started to call it a sort of uh, coup. They stretched the concept of a coup and said it was a sort of legal coup in a, in a way. So it, it actually often is traumatizing for countries, whereas a no confidence vote. So that's an important point. A no confidence vote does not necessarily have to change the power structure because, You know, the, 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 win, the, the side that won the last election can stay in power. For example, take Britain right now. If the Conservative Party decides to remove uh, the prime minister because of all the party stuff in Downing Street, you know, they might be, they, they are easily able to do it and might replace him with another prime minister in the hope of increasing their chances in the next election. So they can do it rather easily without you know, losing power or without necessarily hurting themselves. They might hurt themselves more by leaving him in office. So this is why I think the the no confidence vote is actually sort of a better solution to keep um, democracy stable or to to not let conflicts escalate. Yeah. So it keeps kind of the government accountable on a more stable basis, right? And it strengthens this this principal-agent relationship, whereas the chamber is the principal and the agent is, is, is the government. 
and as you say in the in the impeachment case it's it's kind of a, the impeachment is a legal a tool a legal procedure but it's always politicized right in the end as we saw also in the in the in the US uh, I'd say yes yeah, so that's an important point so this personalization that i'm talking about you know might might, might actually lead to to a reversal of this principal agent relationship and uh, you know there there's this important book by David Samuels and Matthew Schubert, where they um, uh, use this notion of presidentialized parties. So they argue that presidential system systems and semi-presidential systems, parties tend to get presidentialized. And Trump, of course, is a good example because many people in the Republican Party wanted to avoid Trump at all costs, right? But once he got the, the office of the presidency, he basically turned the Republican Party into his own party. And so this party also defended him in the impeachment. So in a sense, the principal agent relationship is even reversed, right? So the agent, the, the party becomes the agent of the president rather than the president being the agent of the party. And, and this, this is exactly, so I would argue this, the structure of presidentialism, this executive personalism, creates presidentialized parties, as they would call it. And that's a, quite a problem for democracy. Maybe because we, we now was, was sidetracked a little, I wanted to make one more comment because uh, you asked me about the structure of, of the two chambers. I think there's one, um, I want to emphasize one more point. So because we said, what are the general uh, advantages of, of the separation of power? So in the semi-parliamentary system, because the second chamber is elected under proportional representation, right? The government will usually not have a majority there, right? So the government will have to find majorities in the second chamber. Um, but as we said, um, the government is usually able to do this in a more flexible way, finding different majorities, issue-specific majorities on different issue, issues. And if you have a good you know, majoritarian electoral system for the first chamber, the likelihood is pretty high that the government the position of the government is located sort of in the center of the political space, which makes it rather easy to build this coalition. And I want to make one point here, because one argument that people often have against these, uh, this issue-specific decision-making is that you know, it costs a lot of energy, it costs a lot of transaction costs. As you know, there are a lot of, you know, in parliamentary system, a lot of people are um, advocating for minority governments, and the counter-argument is always that this is really... Um, very costly to find these majorities. But I just want to say that, again, we, if, if we switch to design thinking and see what is possible in the world, I just want to point to example of, of Denmark. Like Denmark is a country parliamentary system uh, with, a, with a tradition of minority governments. And what they do, for example, is that they do not have to work out always um, legislative coalitions for each bill. But what they do is they say, you know, environmental policy is going to be governed by a set of parties, partly parties in government and party, partly parties in the opposition. And they just make a deal, which is called forelick or political accommodation. So they basically say, in this policy area, this set of parties is going to govern together. And in another policy area, this set of parties is going to govern together. So you can have a mixture. You can have different majorities in different issue areas, but you can still have these majorities in a longer term perspective. And in these sort of arrangements, it's even possible that the opposition parties, in a sense, they become part of the government coalition in these policy areas. So they might get particular access to, to the executive, they might be briefed, they might actually you know, go into the uh, ministries and departments and get information. So you can imagine a sort of separation of power systems where you have some flexibility, but you also have a very predictable um, long-term process. Moving on still to the, to the last question I have. So, you know, uh, presidential, parliamentary, and also semi-presidential systems are quite common. Semi-parliamentary system are less common nonetheless they they do exist in more pure or less pure form um so you in the in the book you mention australia you mentioned japan can you 
explain or describe how semi-polymentarism is implemented in these countries and what are kind of the experiences with it? So I, do, I classify these countries as semi-parliamentary because, as I said, they have directly elected second chambers. But these second chambers do not have a no-confidence vote against the government. This is an important combination. And this combination is actually quite rare. It only exists in Japan and in Australia. Because, and that's important. For example, in a country like Italy or Romania, the second chamber is also directly elected. In Italy, there are also a few, very few unelected ones, but they're basically directly elected. But in these systems, the second chamber also has a no-confidence vote, right? So the, the logic of a parliamentary system is extended to them. So if you look at this combination of directly elected but no no-confidence vote, you only find Japan and Australia. Now, Japan, I don't look at, I mean, I have, I have it in my book, but Japan basically uses some type of mixed proportional representation system or mixed majoritarian system in both chambers. So it doesn't really use the structure in the way that I'm interested in. The interesting way to use the structure is to have the first chamber elected in, on, on a majoritarian basis and the second chamber on a proportional basis. And this is what we find in Australia. These systems are rare, but that's the best we can do, right? Um, so I characterize these systems, how the how the electoral systems work, how the party systems work, and I look empirically if what I think they should be able to do, namely balance these different goals that are more difficult to, uh, to balance under parliamentarism, whether they can balance them in a different way, right? And this is what I find. So the, these two things that are one from such a system that voters can use the first chamber to make a clear choice, do I want a left government, do I want a right government? And they can use the second chamber to have a more, more variety of parties, allow new parties to enter, and it forces the government, in order to pass legislation, they have to make deals, right? So in a sense, you have a stable government, but it has to act like a minority government in the second chamber. And, and this combination, to have an identifiability government who builds flexible coalitions in a in a proportional system, in a proportional uh, second chamber, that combination is simply impossible in a parliamentary system. And I show empirically that this is what these systems can do. And then I, uh, I look at how they can solve their, you know, how they solve deadlocks, how they deal with problems between the two chambers. Um, basically, just to show um, that these systems actually work and this is structure is quite attractive. But then I also say, um, you know, be, because these systems too developed in a path-dependent manner, they were not they were not they were not designed from scratch with the kind of blueprint in mind that I have in mind. Um, they're not optimally designed. So that's why also there's a chapter in the book where I say, well, you know, if if you were designed these systems from scratch, how you would do that, and how you m would make them more attractive as an alternative to to a presidential system. So for anybody who wants to go more into detail to understand better the, the structure, I can strongly recommend the book. And as I said, I will link to it in the show notes. Do you have any other books or articles that you can recommend to the audience? So for me, about the general presidentialism and parliamentarism debate, there are two really important books that were important for my thinking, but I think they're really important for the debate. So one is a book by Jose Chebub from 2007. Um, Presidentialism and Parliamentarism and Democracy, I think, is a title. And that book's really important. It's sort of the, the main, it was a main attack of the Linzian view in a way. It was sort of the counter argument to Linz. And I think it's a really important book, especially for those who tend towards the Linzian view. <laughs> because, I mean, you have to, uh, you have to take Chebub's arguments very seriously. I mean, he's a major voice in this debate. And he knows all the three systems really well. He's done sort of cutting edge original research on parliamentary systems and semi-presidential systems and presidential systems. And I think more than most uh, scholars, he understands that similar systems pop up in all of these systems in different ways. 
So I think he's the one uh, who most prominently pushed back against this Lynchian view. And I think it's important to take these arguments very, very seriously. So the second book I'd recommend, uh, and which was really very important for my own thinking, is the book that I already mentioned by um, David Samuels and Matthew Schubert. Uh, I forget the title. It's something with presidents and prime ministers, I think is the title, or prime ministers and presidents from 2010. And what they do <clears throat> is um, that they look at how different forms of government, um, especially parliamentary government, presidential government, and semi-presidential government um, influence parties, how they shape parties. And I think this book is really very important because it explains why the, um, the choice of the form of government is, is perhaps the most basic and important choice a democracy has to make because the kind of parties you're going to get will determine all the other choices you can make, right? You're going to have a very different democracy with sort of uh, representative disciplined parties or other kinds of parties. Yeah, so quickly, the book is called Presidents, Parties and Prime Ministers, How the Separation of Powers Affects Party Organization and Behavior. Right. And I link to that, of course, in the show notes. So in a sense, this is a, this is sort of the book, a book which, again, then uh, defends Linz, I think, in some ways, in, in some aspects, and expect exactly the kind of aspects that I'm focusing on, too, where like what I call executive personalism. They show, for example, um, as do other studies, that presidential systems, as Linz hypothesized, has a greater tendency to allow outcomers or new uh, outsiders or newcomers like Trump to come in, and that these sort of outsiders and newcomers create a lot of problems for democracy. So the final recommendation I would just give to uh, people that are interested in presidentialism, I think it's really important to understand how presidentialism emerged from monarchy and how many of the uh, people that were... Um, That, that sort of designs these systems were quite happy with the idea of just having elected kings. That's all they wanted. And there's a really nice older paper by William Scheuermann, whom I also um, cite in the book. I think it's from 2005 um, on the monarchical origins of presidentialism in the US. And then there's a more comparative paper, I think from 2013, but you can find them in the book on uh, from Joseph Colomer, who also takes the Latin American experience uh, into account. But again, showing how, how strong sort of this legacy of, of monarchy is in, in presidential systems. Okay, and on, on semi-parliamentarism, one, I would recommend um, a paper uh, published, an article published last year in the Canadian Journal of Comparative and Contemporary Law by, uh, by a colleague of mine, Tarunab Kaitan, who's a law professor at Oxford, And th this paper, on the one hand, it shows that I'm not the only one who thinks about the semi-parliamentary systems and, uh, and defends these kind of systems. So he has a very similar proposal to me. But the other thing that's really nice about this system that he also has this sort of design perspective. You know, he's a constitutional lawyer, very interested in constitutional design. And this paper really shows how you think about constitutional design from first principles. So he starts with parties. He starts with the idea of what kind of parties do you want to have in a democracy? And then you, he, he, he derives certain principles from that. And then he thinks through how you would design a system. And then he ends up with a semi-parliamentary system, which he calls moderated parliamentarism. And there's not to say, I mean, I have disagreements with Tarun. We, we, we don't agree, agree on everything. There's actually also a debate one can find online uh, that was organized uh, by the International Association of Constitutional Law so a number of scholars, also Jose Chebup and others, have commented on Tarun's article. So that's a very interesting debate because it shows you sort of different perspectives on this constitutional design problem. And this can easily be, find, be found um, online. But I think what Tarun and I would agree with, um, no, we don't, we're not saying we have figured this out. We're probably wrong on some issues and we have to learn more. We're just saying that more people should think about this stuff and should be engaged in this sort of design debate. And the last thing I would just uh, maybe a, a plug also. So one thing that I would recommend that will come out this year, um, two colleagues uh, from University College London, Richard Bellamy and Jeff King, are editing an excellent volume, the Cambridge Handbook of Constitutional Theory with Cambridge University Press, which has really like assembled an excellent group of scholars who 
analyze, sort of look at everything constitutional theory in all areas. And um, I had the pleasure and honor to to write the chapter on 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 this presidentialism parliamentarism debate. So in a sense, this will give sort of a uh, short, um, a shorter a summary of the debate and also my own perspective and. This will need some time to come out, but I will also post my contribution, I think, on ResearchGate soon. So if people don't want to look at the whole book, they might want to check out um, this chapter, but also the I think the entire volume will be immensely valuable. Cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot for these recommendations. Sounds all fascinating and uh, a lot of interesting uh, reading coming up for sure, also for me. So I think for the moment, we leave it at that. It has been a very interesting conversation, even though it's not always simple to, to explain these concepts. But I think it has been tremendously interesting. And uh, Stefan, I, I really thank you for, for taking your time. And I can really recommend the book to anyone. So uh, I will link to all these, these resources also in the, in the show notes, of course. Well, thanks so much for having me and for your interest in the book and this work and uh, generally for the work you do with the podcast. Uh, I mean, as is obvious, I think it's really important for us to think about institutions and how we can make them better. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you liked it, please share it with friends or on social media, or leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. It really helps my podcast and my message to be heard. On my website, rulesofthegame.blog, you find a form to give feedback directly back to me, or just send me an email to stefan.kyberts at gmail.com. I would love to hear your comments or suggestions for upcoming episodes. Take care.